Okay, great. So we are live on both YouTube and also here. Do you want to give in a few minutes or do you want to start right on time in four minutes? Um, one second, sorry. Uh, uh, I think maybe we start in like, uh, let's see in terms of a participant uh, uh, when we, so we're already, uh, maybe we wait like maybe one or two minutes. We still have another, I think uh, five minutes. Oh, we, so Sasha is uh, raising hands. Let me see. Hi, Sasha. Oh, no, she is. All right, so let me. All right, great. So uh, Sasha joined us as a panelist. Hi, Sasha. Hello, thank you.
right there. Martin, maybe we can start. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Martin Bichler, and I'm the current president of the Informs Auction and Market Design section. As you all know, market design is a fairly fast growing field at the intersection of operations research, computer science, economics, and actually some other disciplines. The Informs Auctions and Market Design section is really meant to provide a, a platform for colleagues from all of these disciplines to exchange ideas and, and work together. Every year we organize a cluster at the Informs annual meeting and workshops. We also organize special issues and run departments at journals. So if you're interested in market design and our activities, please check out our website and, and do join us. Today, it's really my great pleasure to inaugurate the AMD online seminar series uh, as our most recent activity. I'm very grateful to Ozan Kandoan from Chicago Booth, Vaidi Manshadi from Yale and Fan Yen Seng from Columbia. We've done an amazing job in organizing the series and collected an outstanding set of speakers. Thank you a lot. I'm especially delighted that Nobel laureate Al Roth, uh, who is also on, one of our board members, has volunteered to give the first talk in this series. Thank you, Al. This is very much appreciated. I wish all of you an inspiring talk and hope you sign up also for later talks in this series. Let me hand over to Vaidi now. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the Auctions and Market Design online seminar series. We are delighted to have you with us. Uh, the goal of this interdisciplinary seminar series is to uh, discuss some of the pioneering and impactful works in the broad area of uh, market design. And as our first speaker, uh, we are honored to have uh, Professor Alvin Roth with us. Al is the Craig and Susan McCow uh, Professor of Economics at Stanford University. Uh, as Martin mentioned, in 2012, Al uh, won the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, jointly with uh, Lloyd Shapley for the theory of stable allocation and the practice of market design. Uh, one of the markets that Al has been involved with and has made significant contributions to since its uh, inception is the market for uh, kidney exchange. Uh, these markets have been around for about two decades and uh, they have led to saving uh, many lives, improving quality of life for numerous patients and also reducing the cost of care. Today, Al will uh, talk about an operations uh, perspective on kidney exchange. Al, thank you again for accepting our invitation. We are very happy to have you with us and the floor is yours. Thank you, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, you know, market design is, is naturally a field that crosses disciplines and people who are interested in operations can play a, a very big role in, uh, in advancing market design and, and thinking about it. So, so I hope that this whole talk will, will feel like an invitation. And um, I'm, I'm taking as my title here, the, the title of a, a survey paper that Itai Ashlagi and I have uh, forthcoming in management science. But I, I'm gonna weave a path through that paper in order to make a one hour talk. Um, but but you know, I hope you all take a look at it when it comes out. So one of the principal stories of, of organ transplantation in the United States is we don't have enough organs for all the people who need them. And uh, right now, this morning in the United States, there are almost 100,000 people on the waiting list for deceased donor organs, but we don't have nearly enough organs for them. In 2019, the last full year, we had 16 and a half thousand transplants from deceased donor organs. And it's a long and dangerous wait. The, the life expectancy of someone on dialysis is not so good. And almost 4,000 people died while waiting in 2018. And another 4,000 were, were taken off the list when they became too sick to transplant. So, so the wait is a dangerous one. Um, but what I'm gonna be talking to you about today is primarily uh, transplantation from living donors. And in the United, in the United States in 2019, we had uh, almost 7,000 living donor transplants. Uh, and the reason we can have living donor transplants is that healthy people have two kidneys and can remain uh, healthy with, with just one. And so if there's someone you love who's, who's got kidney failure and is a, a 
dangerous and deadly disease, you might be able to save their life. So I want to tell you about a story that's quite common to market design problems, which is that the, the marketplace is, is not the whole world. The marketplace is a, a small part of a very big world. And so progress gets made incrementally through combinations of changes. And there's medical and social changes, and, but also organizational and operational innovation. So, so the operational innovations are, in some sense, the ones I want to emphasize today. But I can't tell you the story without telling you uh, about some of the medical and social and, and organizational changes as well. So live donation, living donor donation, actually donation of any sort, the first successful organ transplant in the world was done in 1954 in Boston at the Brigham and Women's, what's now the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, and it was a kidney transplant between identical twins. Now the virtue of identical twins is one of the obstacles to successful transplantation is is the recipient's immune system, which uh, has it built to notice foreign bodies and fight them. So if you have an identical twin, then, then your immune system will be happy with your kidney and that made it easy. Since then, there have been a lot of medical advances that let non-identical twins uh, get, give, give and get transplants. Uh, so in 1990, the World Health Organization wrote that organs for transplantation should be removed preferably from deceased persons. However, Adult living persons may donate organs, but in general, such donors should be genetically related. And that was because of two reasons. One was immunological. They hoped to, to be a little bit familiar to your immune system. But, but also, there were a lot of social uh, concerns about donors who were not related to you, and whether it was ethical to, to have unrelated donors um, give kidneys. But by 2001, uh, here's a paper on controversies in organ donation. Uh, and they say, thus far, the majority of kidneys from living donors have been from relatives, but transplant centers have started programs using living unrelated donors. So those were mostly spouses. In other words, among the people who care a lot about you, but are not genetically related to you or your spouse. Um, but, but also friends started to want to give kidneys. You know, there's someone who you like a lot. Uh, you could be an adopted child. You could have all sorts of close relations to people that you're not genetically related to. And it said widespread acceptance of such unconventional donors has not occurred because of the difficult ethical issues raised by this practice. So this was a, a social issue. You know, elsewhere, part of my work is, is involves what I call repugnant transactions, transactions that some people would like to do and other people don't think they should be allowed to do. And this story of, of transplantation is full of repugnant transactions. Uh, and it says an even more eth difficult ethical dilemma arises if the donor happens to be a stranger. Thus far, the use of altruistic strangers has be been considered to be an impenetrable taboo. Now, one reason I mentioned this, uh, this 2001 article is today you're going to see we get great, great benefit from altruistic strangers, from non-directed donors, people who want to give a kidney to someone and, and don't care who it is are today through kidney exchange able to start long chains of donation that result in lots of transplants. So, but this is something that, that uh, you know, we, we were hardly doing kidney exchange in, in 2001 and we certainly weren't using non-directed donors, okay? Now, uh, these guys, uh, Morrissey and Monaco, they actually performed the first kidney exchange in the US. And so the issue is that sometimes you, you love someone enough to give them a kidney you can't give them your kidney because kidneys have to be well matched. So uh, the first kidney exchange looked like this. Donor one wanted to give a kidney to recipient one, but that they had incompatible blood types, donor type A and B, and, and donor two and recipient two had the same problem in reverse. And so you look at the picture and you can see we need a blood type B kidney and we need a blood type A kidney and we have both. So before kidney exchange, we used to send the two donors home. We'd say, so sorry, you can't give to, to the person you want to give to. You're incompatible. We can't do that transplant. Go home. And the recipient would go back to waiting the long, dangerous wait on the, for a deceased donor organ. But what, um, what Monaco and Morrissey did, that, uh, that there had been some earlier kidney exchanges of just this type between AB and BA pairs uh, in South Korea. But what they did for the first time in the US was they said, you know, let's go ahead and, and, and get these two extra transplants that we wouldn't otherwise get. Now, 
you can already see that even in this simple kind of exchange between just two patient donor pairs, it's a little complex. And so you might ask, why can't we just, you know, buy kidney? Sense that there are people who would like to buy a kidney and people who would, who would be prepared to sell one. And indeed, there are illegal black markets. Uh, but in the US and almost everywhere else in the world, it's unlawful for any person to receive or transfer any human organ for valuable consideration for use in human transplantation. So when I say almost everywhere in the world, there's a legal monetary market uh, in the Islamic Republic of Iran. But, but ju that's just about the only place where there's a legal monetary market. There are some gray markets and there are black markets, but in the US, it's, it's quite illegal. On the other hand, it doesn't just say, the American law doesn't just say valuable, it doesn't just say you can't buy a kidney, it says you can't give valuable consideration. So when you look back at that kidney exchange, you might wonder, and the Department of Justice wondered, uh, whether this was legal. Maybe this is a repugnant transaction. These people, they all want to do it. It's going to save two lives, but maybe it's against American law. And the Department of Justice dithered, and they wouldn't write us a memo saying that it was legal. And Congress got together after three tries and passed an amendment that said the preceding sentence, that sentence does not apply with respect to human organ pair donation. And that was passed without any dissenting votes in either the House or the Senate. So while buying a kidney is a repugnant transaction in the United States, kidney exchange is not. And let me take a, a moment from my talk just to show you this next slide, which is what the votes looked like. And I do this purely out of nostalgia for the time when all the Democrats and all the Republicans in the House of Representatives could vote yes on some issue. So that used to happen and maybe it will happen again someday. Uh, and the Senate passed pass the same bill without a vote under rules that are called unanimous consent. So, so in the United States, kidney exchange is not a repugnant transaction. I should mention that in Germany, it is. Uh, German law basically forbids kidney exchange because it only allows you to receive an organ from a member of your immediate family, not just from genetically related people, but from parents, children, siblings. So, so I'm going to tell you about some more repugnant transactions before we're done today and how they were overcome or are being overcome. But before I do that, let me give you a sort of mathematical conceptual prehistory of kidney exchange. And I say conceptual because I'm going to tell you about some good ideas about kidneys, but they aren't the ones that, that led us to, to practical kidney exchange exactly. Uh, so Shapley and Scarf in the first issue, volume one, number one of the Journal of Mathematical Economics, you know, so talk about abstract theory leading to practical things. Uh, they said, let's suppose we're, we're looking at a market that consists of N agents, each endowed with an individual div indivisible good, which they called a house. And each agent has preference over the houses, but you can't use money, right? The National House Transplantation Act says uh, you're not allowed to give valuable consideration for a house. How can we trade them? And after a, a long sort of complicated fixed point argument, they conclude their paper by saying, after we made this long, complicated fixed point argument, David Gale showed us a really simple algorithm. So you have, every, you have everyone point to the house that, that he likes best. Each house points to its owner. There has to be at least one cycle because eventually someone must point to a house that's already been pointed to. And um, that's the top trading cycle. You, you, you let everyone get the house they're pointing to. Everyone who is in that cycle gets their first choice and they leave the market. And then you do it again and again with the remaining houses. And uh, at every step, each agent points to our most preferred house and at least one agent leads the market, leaves the market. A, a, a cycle could be an agent saying of the remaining houses, I like my own best. Uh, and that gives you an allocation. And what they observed was that this is in the core of the game. No set of agents can all do better than to participate. And the reason is if you wanted to find a dissenting coalition, you couldn't uh, recruit anyone from the first cycle because they've all gotten their first choice. And you can't recruit anyone from their second cycle because they've all gotten their first choice, except maybe for houses that left in the first cycle. And no one in the first cycle wants to trade with them because they all got their first choice and so on. Okay, so, so it's in the core. And indeed, uh, it's a dominant strategy. You always have to ask a question when, you, when you're going to think of an allocation mechanism where you're going to ask people their preferences. Will they tell us their true preferences? And indeed, there's a reason for them to tell their true preferences. And it's not hard to prove. Um, but I think I won't prove it now, except to 
let me just give you a, a, a very brief idea, because, partly because I want to show you this picture of cycles and chains. So, so what's going on in this picture? We've said to everyone, each, each circle is a person in a house or a, a patient donor pair, uh, a patient with a, with a kidney. Uh, we've said to them, point to the house you like best. And we've got some cycles here and we've got some chains. But when we want to say that it's, that it's a dominant strategy to state your true preferences, we have to look at someone like, like Mr. I here, who has pointed to his first choice as we asked him to. But we can see he's not going to get it because his first choice happens to be in a cycle and he's not part of that cycle. So when we, when we take the, the cycles away, he's going to be left pointing into space. And the question is, could he have done better by, by telling us something different than his true first choice? And the answer is that he doesn't come to any harm because he could have pointed to this person and gotten this kidney immediately. They would have been a two-way cycle or this person, they would have been a three-way. But those people can't go anywhere because they can't leave the picture. They, they can't become part of a cycle until he becomes part of a cycle. Because when we say to everyone else, now that the cycles are gone, point to who you like best, they're going to keep pointing to the same people because he hasn't left yet. And so no part of his chain is going to be altered. So he can always get these guys. And now he might be able to get this person if, if she points to him or to someone in the chain and so forth. So, so he might not get his first choice when he tells us what's his true first choice, but he's not going to come to any harm. He's not going to do worse than he could have. So the, the building blocks for our first thoughts about kidney exchange were, were this uh, top trading cycles and a paper that Typhoon Sunmez and Utu Unver and I wrote that, that explored the idea of top, top trading cycles for, for forming cycles and chains in kidney exchange. But we sent that paper to a bunch of surgeons. And, uh, and, and one of the first things we learned when we started to talk to Frank Delmonico, and, and we helped him start the New England program for kidney exchange, is that those cycles and chains, you know, especially if you know, some of those cycles could be really long. We could have a cycle of consisting of all the people here, for instance. Uh, cycles, uh, long cycles and chains aren't so easy to execute. So let's think about that a little bit, OK? Here's a picture of half of a, of a kidney exchange going on in 2006. Um, I'm the man in the yellow gown, being careful not to touch anything. Uh, there's a kidney in, in this bucket. It's, it's recently come out of, of the adjacent operating room that isn't in the picture. Uh, and it's going into this gentleman. And at the same time, this is happening in Cincinnati, Ohio. And at the same time in Toledo, Ohio, Mike Reese is doing the same thing with the other donor and the other patient. When I say at the same time, what I mean is uh, Steve Woodall, the surgeon in the tiger skin cap, uh, after the initial incisions, after that the patients were successfully anesthetized and the initial incisions had been made, he got on his cell phone from the OR and he called Mike and he said, we're ready, are you ready? And when he heard that they were, they went ahead and they took out the kidney, they did the nephrectomy. The reason they were doing it simultaneously is because the law says you can't give valuable consideration for a kidney, even though you can do kidney exchange. What that means is you can't write a legally binding contract for a kidney. If, if, if something went wrong, it might be that one pair got a kidney and the other didn't, and, and that would be something we really want to avoid. So they do it really simultaneously. But that means it's congested. It means that to do that simple exchange between just two pairs, you need four simultaneous operating rooms, two in Cincinnati and two in Toledo, four ready surgical teams, two for the nephrectomies and two for the transplants. That's a little hard to arrange. So, so basically, when we, when we first started in, in, 2000, in the early 2000s, when we first started to talk to our surgical colleagues and we said, how about these long chains and long cycles, big cycles, they said to us, don't kid yourself. It's really hard to do these. Um, if you're going to help us, you have to help us just figure out how to organize exchanges, uh, multi-hospital, inter-hospital exchanges between just two pairs at a time, pairwise kidney exchange. When you do that, you get some beautiful, you get to type, tap into some very lovely old graph theory. You get to use Edmund's algorithm. You, you get to use all sorts of nice stuff, but it's costly to limit yourself to pairwise kidney exchange because, um, because you're looking for what economists call a double coincidence of wants, which, which doesn't happen so often. You're looking for pairs that have the property that, that each one has a kidney that the other one can use. So you'd like to be able to expand the kind of exchanges you can do. 
And one of the ways you can do that is start chains that have a, in particular, if you have non-directed donors, these are those, those donors who don't care who they're, who they're giving to. And, and eventually by the, by the 2000s, they were accepted in the United States. And what they used to do before kidney exchange is if you, if you presented yourself as a non-directed donor and, uh, and, and went through a whole battery of both medical and psychological tests and were successful, then they would offer you the opportunity to give a kidney to someone on the waiting list. And that's a, a great thing and you could save their life. But now that we had a pool of patient donor pairs, they could offer you something even more enticing, which is you'll give a kidney to the recipient of a, of a, a patient donor pair that's waiting for exchange and having trouble finding one. And the donor will pass it forward to another recipient and, and the donor from that pair will give to someone on the wait list, right? So you might be able to, to cause three transplants with not just the one that, that you're giving directly with your kidney. So here's a picture in 2007 of such a chain. And one question is how come there are only six people in the picture? And the answer is because we had figured out by that time how to do three-way cycles so we could we could muster, logistically, we could muster six operating rooms at a time. And if you want to do it simultaneously, you need six operating rooms. And that's the story here. These, these represent the, the three transplants and three nephrectomies that, that go on for that three-way chain. But the question is, if we have a non-directed donor, do we, do we really need to do all these simultaneously? Because the reason we do conventional cycles simultaneously is supposing instead, this is a counterfactual, supposing instead we did them first one day and then the next day. Well, on the first day, the donor from pair two might successfully give to the recipient in pair one. And on the second day, something might go wrong. For whatever reason, donor one doesn't give to the recipient two. Well, that's a, pair two has really been harmed because they had a surgery that didn't help them and they no longer have a kidney. So when we do the next, round of kidney exchange, they won't be able to participate. But if, the if we can start a chain begun by a non-directed donor, then, then we can arrange it so that each pair gets a kidney before they give one. And if, if the chain is broken, for whatever reason it was broken here, if it's broken, that's, that's very disappointing to pair two, but they haven't been irreparably harmed they're no worse off than they were before the non-directed donor appeared. And in particular, they still have a kidney. They can, they can give in exchange and be part of a future kidney exchange. So we started to, to think about if the costs of being non-simultaneous are, are reduced, the risk, how about the benefits? And we, we talked about this in a hypothetical way uh, with our surgical colleague, Frank Delmonico, uh, but it was Mike Reese in Toledo, the, the guy not in the picture, uh, the guy at the other end of the phone in, in the earlier picture I showed you, who, who did the first non-simultaneous extended altruistic donor chain, the first need chain. And here's a picture of it. This is the picture that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine. And here's a picture that appeared in, in People Magazine, where people had stepped out from behind their HIPAA privacy protection. And uh, it, you can see it's pretty long. And it wasn't simultaneous. It began in July and, and the, the last by the time the, the New England Journal article went to press, the, the most recent transplant had been in 2008. So it had, had extended almost over a year. Uh, and it had gotten a bunch of transplants, there's 12. And the last lady on the list who, who permits her name to be used, it's Helena McKinney, uh, she was blood type AB. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. That meant it was hard to find a match for her because most of the people who need AB uh, uh, kidneys can take them from their, their intended donor. So she actually had to wait two or three years, I, I forget, but, but she was still game when they found her a good match and she added another 12 people to the picture. So, uh, so chains can be long. And that's why today more than half of the kidney exchange transplants I'm gonna tell you about, and we did more than a thousand last year, uh, take, come from chains, okay? Uh, but they didn't catch on right away. There was opposition uh, of various sorts. Some of it was what happens if it breaks? You know, won't that be terrible? Maybe we shouldn't even start them. Turns out about 2% of the chains break in ways that you can't repair. Uh, so it's well worth it. I mean, we, we, the, the average chain in the United States has 
as five transplants, so it has 10 people in the picture. Uh, and Itai Ashlagi uh, was the leader in, in helping it come to common acceptance. I mean, he, he uh, you know, we wrote these papers on, on analyzing just what non-simultaneous chains do and how effective they are and why they're effective. And I want to tell you a little bit about that. But chains can be pretty long. This is not the longest one, but it was in 2012. Uh, and it had 60 people in the picture. Okay, that's 30 transplants, right? 30 donors and 30 recipients. Uh, so that, that's one of the reasons why chains are effective. And again, the average chain in the US has, has 10 people in the picture. But chains are computationally hard to find. Turns out cycles are pretty easy. And if you have no limit on the number of cycles, then, then you can find a maximum set of cycles a set of cycles that has a maximum set of transplants in polynomial time. But if you have chains or if you have uh, cycles that can't be longer than say three pairs, then, then the problem becomes NP complete. So, so it's, it's computationally hard and there are hard instances. So right now the best software for doing this kind of thing is the software that Itai Ashlagi has built and is, is used in, in a number of hospitals. Uh, and my understanding is that they, you know, we actually encounter hard instances. This is not one of those problems where you say it could be hard, but by, um, but by good luck, we, we never find any hard problems. On the contrary, we find hard problems, but by good luck, we've always been able to solve them, right? So you're able to get optimal solutions, although we can't promise that you will be. And we use heuristic methods to do it. So part of the story is if you're going to have, um, if you're going to have um, constraints that, that say things like you have no cycles with length greater than three pairs, uh, there could be lots of cycles. And if you say six pairs, you know, there are even more. Uh, so that you have more constraints than you can easily load up on a commercial solver. And so one of the things they do, for instance, is they, they solve the problem without those constraints. And then they see which cycles are too long and they put in specific constraints against those cycles and solve it again. And that, that is one of the, the several tricks that they use to make these problems uh, solvable. I, I should mention that um, in this particular formulation that comes from this NAS paper, uh, you don't see any chains, but you don't have to see chains because a chain starts with a non-directed donor. You can just model it as you say, the non-directed donor has an artificial companion who, who can receive every kidney. So every chain is a cycle that ends back at the at the non-directed donor. So, so it's a way of thinking about the, the integer program that lets you not think of chains differently than cycles. Okay, so, so let me tell you a few things about uh, who can take what kidney. Uh, you all know that you've got blood types and basically there's a, a blood component. There are two blood components called A and B. And if you have one of them, you have blood type A or blood type B. And if you have both of them, you have blood type AB. And if you have Neither of them, you have what in English we call blood type O, but in many languages it's called blood type zero. And what it means is you don't have any of them. And the rule is you, can, uh, you can't take a kidney from someone who has one of these blood components that you don't have. So everyone can take an O kidney and O patients as well, but only B patients and AB patients can take a, uh, a B kidney and only A patients and AB patients can take an AB kidney. And O donors can only receive O kidneys, and, but they can give to everyone. And AB donors can receive any kidney, but can only give to AB patients. So that's blood type. And if that was all that was going on, then we would never see any incompatible patient donor pairs where the donor had blood type O, because the, if the person who loves you has blood type O, they can always give you a kidney. But that's not the only issue by far. There's also what we call tissue type compatibility, but is much less simply organized. It turns out you have a, a, a vector of human leukocyte antigens, which excite your immune system. When your immune system notices them, they, they are uh, prepared to build antibodies against them. And if you already have antibodies against them, then you can't take a kidney from someone who has one of those HLAs. And in the general population, we, we talk about how sensitive you are in terms of your percent reactive antibodies, which is sort of, think of it as a number between zero and 100, representing the probability that you can't accept a kidney from someone who is blood type compatible with you. 
So, you, so the probability that you couldn't accept a kidney from an O donor, for example. And about 10% of the general population has high PRA, which we talk about between, we used to say between 80 and 100. Now, with the successes we've had, I'd say between 90 and 100, or even 95 and 100 is, is high PRA. But let's look at this 10% number. Because in kidney exchange, we have much higher percentage of people with high PRA. Okay, so, so here's data from, from a couple of the big kidney exchange uh, networks. And what you see is it's bimodal. We have some very low sensitized people and some very high sensitized people. And when you blow up this high sensitized part of the graph, what you see is these people who, are, who, are, who can't take between 95 and 100% of the kidneys, they're concentrated really on the ones who, who the best estimate is 99 to 100%. So these are really hard to match people and they're, and they're hard to match even with kidney exchange. Sometimes you can match them, you know, 100% is an approximation. Sometimes you, you find people that can match and sometimes you can do work that, that reduces their sensitivity. You can do what's called desensitization, but that's a, a complicated story. And, uh, and when we look at cycles and chains, we find that more than 60% of transplants in kidney exchange are done through chains. And it has to do with these highly sensitized people. So let me tell you about that. Why do we need long chains? Well, the first question is how come we have all these highly sensitized people when, when the general population is only 10% highly sensitized and that's a, a broad measure of high sensitivity. And we have 50% of, of our patients in the interhospital exchanges are extremely highly sensitized. Well, uh, partly it's because hospitals are withholding their easy to match pairs and, and, and doing exchanges internally. Okay, so if they have easy to match pairs, there's a temptation to say to them, why don't you wait till next week and, and maybe we'll have a pair we can just match you locally. You won't have to enroll in, you know, we won't have to share your data with other transplant centers and do all the complicated logistical things that, that we have to do for kidney exchange. So the logistics are a, a real obstacle. One of the logistics involves payment. Uh, we've just recently started to have standard acquisition charges for living donor kidneys. But we used to have, you know, two hospitals would exchange kidneys by, by air and, and then they'd bill each other and they'd bill each other different amounts for nephrectomies because of the way they did their accounting. And that of course causes a lot of friction. But uh, Nikhil Agarwal and Itai Ashlagi and Edward Azevedo and Clayton Featherstone and Omar Karadaman, uh, They've been looking at, at the whole set of, of kidney exchanges done in the United States, not just by the interhospital network. And what they find is most transplants are arranged by hospitals instead of national platforms. That is, easy exchanges are being done within hospitals, and the hard exchanges are being sent to the interhospital platforms. And that's why they're, that's one of the reasons why there are so many highly sensitized patients. Those are the hard to match ones that you can't do in your own hospital, even if you're a big transplant center. The other reason is because they're hard to match, you accumulate a lot of them. So that's one reason why we have highly, that, that's why we have highly sensitized patients. Let's think why we need long chains. Here is a snapshot, a moment from the Alliance for Paired Kidney Donation of, of 38 pairs, 30 of which are high PRA. And what these were, were at that moment in time, these were all the patients and donors who both had blood type A. Okay, so, so we're just looking at patients with blood type A and their donors, and each circle is a patient donor pair. And an arrow goes from one circle to another circle if the donor in the first pair is compatible with the patient in the second. And what you see in blue, we have these eight pairs that are lucky. They're, they're uh, not highly sensitized. They can uh, get a kidney from, from just about anyone. Uh, so there are a lot of incoming pairs, but many of these have very, very few incoming pairs. And what that means is we could do something, we, we, if, we, if we were a hospital, we might be able to arrange exchanges between the blue pairs, but that would leave most of the white pairs uh, unmatched. So what you'd like to do is get them all together. Now, supposing you have a big room full of these people, everybody has blood type A, so there's no blood type incompatibility, but they're very highly sensitized. What are we gonna find when we find uh, a possible transplant? Well, we're gonna find that there's not an arrow going back in the other direction. They can't give it back, but maybe they can give it to someone else. And maybe that someone else can give it to, to, to someone else and so forth. So, so, you know, my pair can give you guys a kidney. It's hard for us to give any of, any of you a kidney because many of you are highly sensitized, but in a big room, we can give someone a kidney and you can't give it back to us because we're highly sensitized, but you can give it to someone else because it's a big room. And 
And so we start to build a chain or a very long cycle. So that's why we get these long chains. So I'll, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, just one uh, clarifying question. Uh, can, you, can we test in advance for high PRA uh, patients or is it something that we, are, we learn after the transplant? No, no, you can test for advance. You can, you can look for their antibodies and we've gotten better and better that over the 20 years I've been in this business. So we're doing better and better. It used to be, you knew they were high PRA, but you, in the end, there's an actual mixture of the bloods you know, between the donor and the recipient to, to tell for sure. But before that, you can do a virtual cross-match because you have a test for antibodies of the patient and you have a list of the donor HLAs, human leukocyte antigens, and you see whether the patient has an antibody against one of the HLAs. Uh, and often, if someone had a lot of antibodies, you had missed some, uh, and we didn't understand exactly which antibodies were against which HLAs, so we had a lot of rejections when it came time to actually do the transplant. And those have gone way down. So right. uh, you definitely test in advance, but the virtual cost match is not the last word. Before an actual transplant, blood samples are, are exchanged and tested together. Right. Great. And so let me also uh, uh, use this. Thank you, Al. Uh, that was a clarifying question from the audience. Let me also uh, use this opportunity to just say that if you have uh, questions during the talk, please type them in the Q&A box. I will uh, try to read them at appropriate times. Otherwise, at the end of the talk, we will open, for, uh, open up for live questions. Thanks. Okay. So here's a picture of how kidney exchange has grown in the United States. Blue is pair exchanges between pairs and, and orange is the non-directed donors, the, the people who can begin chains. And you know, we're doing pretty well. And in fact, the, the, you know, this last year is, is better yet. So, so, you know, we now have over a thousand exchanges a year. And if I had run out of time, I could stop the talk right here. And I would have told you about victory after victory and how we're doing great. But, but we're winning these victories. These, we're winning these victories in a war that we're losing. Okay, remember, there are 100,000 people uh, on the waiting list. When I started working in transplantation, there were 40 some thousand people. And I've just told you about the United States, and I could have told you a similar story about Britain and the Netherlands, where they have pretty good kidney exchange now. They, they don't use chains yet as effectively as we do, but they're, they're working on it. But it turns out there are lots of people in the world who die each year for lack of transplant for financial reasons, okay? Um, it, kidney disease is one of the top 10 causes of death everywhere in the world. So, so the question is, how about what can we do to help them? And, and is there some kind of mutual aid we can do? And what I want to tell you next is about how we might cross borders uh, with kidney exchange. And one reason I started by telling you about how we didn't used to like unrelated donors, and then we didn't used to like, you know, stranger donors. It turns out I'm going to tell you about something. I think it's a great idea. It's aroused all, it aroused a lot of immediate opposition, and now we're seeing the opposition fall away. So I'm pretty optimistic about this, but it's but it's not easy and not just for analytical reasons and logistical reasons, although there are many of those. So this picture is a picture of the world. I'm, I'm gonna just tell, talk about a little of the world. Red is deceased donor transplants. Blue is uh, living donor transplants per million population. So here's the USA where we're edged out a little bit by Spain, which has a very good deceased donor transplants per million population. But I wanna draw your attention to Mexico and the Philippines, which neither of them has kidney exchange. and uh, but they both have transplants. That is, if you were in Mexico or the Philippines, you could get a high quality transplant if you needed one and could afford it. But for instance, in the Philippines, that's this picture, not the, not the big one. In the Philippines, very few people can afford it because the national health insurance doesn't cover transplantation. So there are people who need kidneys in the Philippines who aren't getting them. And one question is, could we invite them into the United States in paired kidney exchange, in kidney exchange, in, in chains or whatever, uh, where remember all those people we have who are highly sensitized, who are having trouble finding a kidney in the United States, they might be able to match with someone outside of the United States. The world is big and we might be able to, to save the lives of the, of the foreign couple who, who aren't gonna get a transplant at home in the Philippines. So here's the first pair. There, there have been about 10 of these so far. And the, the chain was begun by an American uh, donor with blood type A, blood type A being quite common it, it, for various reasons. It's sometimes hard to start a long chain with a blood type A person. Uh, 
the patient is Jose from that picture and his wife is Christina and she's blood type O as it happens. And, and then we have a, a long chain. So they get their kidney, they you know, are home safely. Uh, there's an escrow fund in Ohio that, that pays for their medical care, which is quite cheap. They, so once they're home, they get good medical care again, right? They don't need a transplant anymore. They just need post-operative care for the donor and for the patient, uh, which they can get for a long time. And, and this was a while ago. This was in uh, 2014. So, so you know, they've been doing fine. And the question is, how do we afford it? How can we give away a transplant? And the answer is that this is a self-financing proposal because transplantation in the United States and, and in most of the world is not only the best form of treatment, it's also the cheapest because the alternative is dialysis. And a transplant costs roughly the same as a year of dialysis. But after you do a year of dialysis, you have to do another year of dialysis. And after you do a transplant, you don't. So, so it's, it really saves some parts of the American healthcare system a lot of money whenever a hard to match American, an American who would be a long time on dialysis is uh, given a transplant. And, and you can do some analysis of how this will scale and it remains self-financing to a very large scale, okay? Uh, so, so global kidney exchange is pretty special because mostly when we think about giving medical foreign aid, we think about things that are very cheap because they go a long way in countries that don't have a lot of money for medical care. But this is something that normally you would think maybe we shouldn't be helping middle-income countries start transplant programs because transplantation is, exp is expensive. Turns out they have transplant programs. So, so you know, their priority, they have their own priorities. But, but, the, but the fact is this, is, this is not foreign aid. This is mutual aid because, because we have untransplanted patients in the US who can be transplanted and the savings from that transplantation can go to pay for the care of the foreign patient and donor. So we wrote a, a paper about this and it came out in the American Journal of Transplantation. And in the same issue came some, an editorial in opposition that said, this is a bad idea. You, know, you really have to be careful here. Uh, bringing people across borders doesn't sound like a good idea for transplantation. And then there were a whole series of statements, some in letters and some on websites basically saying, you know, global kidney exchange is a lot like organ trafficking, and we have laws against organ trafficking, against buying organs. This is too much like buying them. So this was, this was a little disappointing, but, but I also study repugnant transactions, so it was also pretty interesting. Uh, and I got to uh, participate as a participant. Here's the head of the Spanish uh, National Organ Transplant saying that the, the Spanish National Organ Transplant has prevented the entry in Europe of a new form of organ trafficking proposed by a Nobel Prize winner in economics. So, you know, you wonder who she's got in mind. Uh, so so I, I got to be called an organ trafficker. Um, but it turns out there's also support for this. So the American Society of Transplant Surgeons was an early supporter. Uh, India, uh, not India, Italy's uh, representative to the World Health Organization proposed that the WHO should uh, sponsor this. Uh, and, and more importantly, it's well received where it's happening. So here's a second exchange chain that has a Mexican pair in the middle. The story about this pair is, you know, the chain is all Americans and it's about to end with this type A donor who is 67 years old. And, and we were having trouble finding a, someone who would take her kidney because, because there's some, uh, there's some reluctance to take older donors in the United States. And she's not very old. I mean, she's younger than I am. Uh, but, uh, but our policies on older donors are very different than, say, in France, where they, where they use a lot more older donors than we do with great success. But, but anyway, here's a Mexican pair who comes, and they can continue. They're much younger. Uh, you know, they're in their 40s, and they continue the chain. Uh, so the question is, you know, is this organ trafficking? Well, here's... It, it made the front page of Newsweek on Espanol, the, the Latin American version of Newsweek. And, and what it says on the cover is transplants of kidneys between the US and Mexico, a bridge of life. And the first paragraph says, just as US President Donald Trump is seeking to build a wall of thousands of miles across the border, uh, you know, a tireless surgeon and an economist join forces to exchange organs between citizens of both countries. So there, 
they're not looking at it as organ trafficking. They're looking at it as you know, not exploiting this Mexican pair, but, but rather saving the life of a Mexican patient and letting her cousin give her a kidney. And they're doing fine together. The cousin recently won a book award and I, I just exchanged emails with the patient. Uh, they don't look exploited to me. And now in the literature, we're starting to see support. So in The Lancet, just last year, uh, just a year ago, there's a paper by three philosophers, one of whom, Peter Singer, is quite, quite a famous moral philosopher. And it says, you know, the GKE has been accused of being a form of organ trafficking, exploiting the poor, involving coercion, coercion and commodification of donors. We refute these claims, and they go on. They, they write a very clear article. I, I recommend it to you. And even more importantly, the ESOT, the European Society of Transplantation, just published a paper which says, you know, global kidney exchange doesn't violate the non-payment principle and, uh, you know, it's, it's not exploiting people. And they go on to notice that it's a little odd that the World Health Organization uh, wants countries, poor countries in particular, to, to become self-sufficient. They don't want organ donation and, and transplantation to go across borders uh, because no country is self-sufficient. The United States isn't self-sufficient. I mean, we don't, we don't help a lot of patients from across the world and we don't, we don't get donations from their, their paired donors, but many, many of our patients die without transplant. So I want to end by telling you a bit how we're going to try to address that because repugnance is a real thing. That is, we're getting more and more support, but, but the whole idea of kidney exchange was we were going to increase transplants without paying for kidneys. And so we'd like to increase global kidney exchange without making people mad at us. And, and one of the ways they're mad at us is they say, uh, you know, we're not helping other countries become self-sufficient. Just incidentally, we, we just wrote a, a, a comment on all this. I just want to say that in medicine, you can have a lot of co-authors. And we, so, so there are 21 co-authors on this. And that's another expression. They're from an, inter, you know, an international group of surgeons. That's another expression of support. But here's what we're talking about uh, now. The latest thing we're talking about. We're saying, you know, instead of having the foreign patient come to the US, we could start a chain that, that couldn't otherwise be funded in the Philippines, say. And then the, the last person in the chain could come to the US and either give to an American patient on the deceased donor waiting list or, or continue the chain with, with someone in the exchange pool and that would eventually end. So we might be able to fund several transplants, a chain of transplants, say, in the Philippines that wouldn't otherwise be fundable with the savings to the American healthcare system from the transplant or the chain that couldn't have been started without the last person in the chain from the Philippines coming to the US. And we're optimistic that that, that will, on the one hand, start to help lots of people in, in middle-income countries where there is a, a financial barrier to transplantation. And we'll, we'll also help uh, you know, American donors. And the, we have to figure out how to do the financial engineering, because it's, there, there are some complicated stories. Uh, the, you know, most transplants in the US are paid for by Medicare, but Medicare won't pay for a Philippine uh, set of transplants happening in the Philippines. But, uh, but American patients are often insured by self-insuring companies that, that write the bill when the, uh, if, if the patient is, is sick in, in the first 33 months. After 33 months, Medicare takes over. But if one of you people who works at a university became, God forbid, uh, you know, a, a kidney failure patient, your insurance would cover you for the first 33 months. And 33 months of dialysis is much more expensive than transplantation. So there's a lot of savings for transplant. So when I talk about the future, you know, I was recently in Ahmedabad in India, and I witnessed a, a robotic transplant that, you know, was, was really modern. You know, the surgeon is looking at this highly magnified uh, thing. So, uh, and, it, and he's not connected. The patient is, is, uh, is over here, you know, and, and the surgeon and I are not gloved or anything. I came into this operating room and the surgeon got up and shook my hand, you know, skin to skin. This is before COVID. So I wasn't afraid to shake his hand, but I was shocked because I'd never been in an operating room where, where you could shake hands. Uh, but he could be far away too. I mean, he happens to be very close and there's a whole team of, of assistants there, but, but, he, but he, with good internet connections, you know, good 5G connections, he could be somewhere else. So the, the possibility of kidney exchange with patients and donors around the world is, is very real. 
Okay, so uh, let me end the talk in time for, for some questions. Uh, this is the final paragraph of my paper with ETA, uh, the survey paper that's coming out. It says, looking back, kidney exchange has accomplished a lot, but not nearly enough. The number of people waiting for a kidney transplant is growing despite the growth of exchange, but there's room for kidney exchange to continue to grow and to increase the availability of transplants further by designing international kidney exchanges, by doing some other things that I didn't tell you about uh, today, like starting chains with deceased donor kidneys, and by introducing other market design in innovations that have yet to be explored or even conceived. And so all of these things involve how, how kidney exchange is organized, how the operations are carried out, the logistics, there's plenty of analytics, all of these things play critical roles. So those who, of you who are listening to this talk because you're members of INFORMS, you know, you're all invited to jump in. This is an area where uh, we can use a lot of help and there's a lot of help we can give. Uh, and it's too big a problem to be left just to the surgeons or just the surgeons and the economists. Uh, th there's room for everyone to help. Thank you. Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, thanks so much, Al, for this inspiring talk. There are quite a few questions. So uh, I think I'm going to open up for live questions. Uh, let's start with Shio. So, uh, Shio, you can, if you unmute yourself, you can speak. Okay. Hello, Al. How are you? This is Sham Sundar. Oh, hey, um, how are you? Hi. Uh, so, this is uh, uh, my question is very simple. Uh, in addition to going international, uh, did you suggest that if these hospitals could be persuaded not to do local exchanges to the extent more of the donors can be brought into the exchange, a larger percentage of all donors could yeah. be in the exchange, the overall efficiency of exchange will rise. And I was wondering how sensitive is that efficiency to the participation rate, or when, you know, sorry, to the sorry. these kidneys being siphoned off by local hospitals. Yeah, so New Haven is is involved in kidney exchange, uh, but um, but you need a, a certain scale, and we, you can't measure the scale by the number of patient donor pairs you have because you might have been accumulating them, and some of them might be very hard to match. But if you had, but but it looks like if you if you have a, a robust um, set of, of enrollments, uh, you get to scale pretty quickly. If, if, you know, if you get sort of 200 pairs a year, it's not, you're at scale, but it's not too inefficient for you to be doing it at your own hospital. But if you're less than that, it might be. So, uh, so what we'd like is, well, we'd like everyone for just the reasons you say, if, if everyone contributed their patient donor pairs, we could do more national exchanges. But in particular, if you're a small hospital, you should almost never be doing national exchange, internal exchanges. And one way to tell if you're acting at an inefficient scale is if you find yourself giving blood type O kidneys to patients who don't need blood type O kidneys, who aren't blood type O, because one of the shortages is of blood type O kidneys. So, but you can always give it to someone. So if you just have pairs, you know, you have, uh, you know, a patient donor pair that is an AO, and you could have them exchange with an AA, that's an inefficient uh, exchange, that O patient could have gone to an O donor and we could have gotten an A kidney to your A patient. So if I may say, ask if that appears like it's a kind of public good, private good exchange uh, consideration for the local hospital, uh, they get an immediate exchange or can satisfy the patient right away as opposed to yep. going but to the exchange and some, then waiting perhaps. So some of the reason they do it is uh, Speed. Some of it's simplicity. You're just dealing with the the insurers you already know. Um, but some of it is financial. I, I already indicated that that uh, you know dealing with hospitals elsewhere. Some of it is logistical. You have to ship kidneys. Um, so so that's right. So I think the one of the things for us to do is make the the operation simpler and more transparent and and easier so that hospitals that are being deterred from joining inter-hospital exchanges because of the, the complexities are less deterred. That's absolutely an important frontier to be pushing on. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, great. Uh, Yanai, do you, you want to ask your question? And also, I read some more questions from the chat. Hi. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? I can yes. hear you, Yanai. Yeah, how are you? I'm well. Uh, so, so let me go to the, the ethics part of, of GKE and ask a few hard questions. Uh, so the first one, on one hand, you object to hospitals keeping, you object in some sense, you know, you, you, you would like it not to be the case that hosp uh, for hospitals to, to keep easy to match patients to themselves, but only try to match hard to match ones nationally. But isn't GKE exactly the U.S. keeping? easy to match patients to itself and only trying to match hard to match ones internationally. I mean, categorically speaking, what's the difference? That's my first question. My, I mean, you know, because in, in, and the, the second question is for that chain that starts in the Philippines, exactly the, the, the slide you have now, isn't that in a sense the U.S. buying a kidney from the Philippines right at that uh, dashed line? So, so isn't that buying an organ? And, and the last question, these are all related, is, is for GKE, so, so you say that it's global, but it really seems like, you know, the, uh, and, and, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, exaggerating here, et cetera, et cetera. It, it seems from, at least from the chains that you've shown us that it, the US basically is trying to, to create long chains and whenever it gets stuck, it cherry picks someone from a poor country to complete that chain. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating here, I'm sorry about that. Isn't, so say that other countries were also to try to do these global kidney exchanges where, you know, they would try to match within their country and, and then cherry pick from, from other countries whenever it, it helps them. Isn't there a chance of, of you know, really a market, like a, a monetary market, because, you know, maybe there's a, a easy to match kidney somewhere in, in, in developing country and, and both the US GKE and the something else GKE approaches them, then, you know, it starts a bidding war in some sense. Aren't you afraid that it's going to develop in that direction? Thank you. So, so let me answer. Those are good questions because a lot of the early objection were, you know, was like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, so I urge you to read the paper in The Lancet, say, by Peter Singer. Mm -hmm. But I gave a talk like this in Geneva in front of an audience of transplant people and, and the world health organization. And there was a Spanish transplant mid-level executive of the WHO in charge of transplants. And he, he asked the first question and, and his question was a little like yours, but much more accusatory, you know. And I flipped back to this slide. I, I, I've used one of these slides before. And, um, and I said to him, you understand that, that uh, Jose would be dead if, if we hadn't brought him to the United States and transplanted him. And he was so happy because I'd made his point for him. He said, he should be dead. And the idea was somehow that we were exploiting the, the future medical care in the country by saving a patient who wouldn't have been saved now. I mean, you, you don't live that long with kidneys. It'll take a long time before the Philippines are transplanting a lot. So, um, so just incidentally, when I, um, I showed you one of the papers that addressed this a little bit, um, you know, uh, Here's an argument by the, the European uh, Society of Transplantation. There's a quote from their paper. They say, the argument to ban GKE because of the need to achieve self-sufficiency in, in you know, small countries implies that the need for countries to become self-sufficient is more important than the lives that can be immediately saved. So that's, that's one question. But the other is that you know, we're, not, we're trying to build kidney exchange in, in Mexico. We've, we've started a kidney exchange thing called uh, Prodinal. Um, and right now we're, we're talking about doing transplants that wouldn't otherwise get done. The, the Philippines or you know, Mexico with very little kidney exchange does very few. Mexico is a better financial story. So let's stick to the Philippines because Mexicans can, can more quickly get on their feet with kidney exchange, but they, they just don't, don't have it. So these are, these are transplants that will be done in the Philippines that wouldn't have been done if not financed with the, the American system. And um, that, furthermore, supposing they were all in the US, mm -hmm. everything you say about cherry picking an easy one, that's how we make uh, long chains. The way you match hard to match patients is by finding an easy to match patient who can plug a gap between two hard to match patients. That's one of the ways you, you find it. So kidney exchange 
potentially has all the ethical problems you worry about. Some people find exchanges and some don't. In order to get a kidney, you need to have a donor that someone else can get a kidney from. And that's a, a lucky matching thing. There are equally uh, deserving people who get kidneys quickly in kidney exchange and those who, who don't. So I think it's a general problem of kidney exchange that, that luck, you know, which kidneys are compatible plays a big role. So you're quite right. What we're talking about in a bridge donor is someone who, who is a, a lucky match and that's why their partner got a kidney. So I'm not dismissing people's concerns, but I think the ones you mentioned, I mean, are, you're, you know, you should read the, the article in the Lancet and let me know whether you feel better. You know, that's Peter Singer arguing more clearly than I have argued that this is okay. Uh, okay, thank you. I'll, I'll take a look at that article, thank you. All right, thanks so much. Let's uh, take maybe a few more questions. Uh, Roger? Uh, hi, uh, this is uh, Roger Rios from Mexico. Hi, Al, how are you? I'm well, how about you? Uh, yeah, well, we were in touch a few years ago and uh, I'd like to thank you. You were very, very kind on sharing some of your experience in, in Mexico. And, and now that you speak about Mexico, uh, we've been doing some work for the past three, four years and we are about to finish writing our first uh, results. But I just wanted to share with you that uh, and I don't know if it's some behavior that you have seen in other countries, like the, the distribution of blood type among the Mexican population is very different than the, the, the distribution on the, on the American population. And so we did some studies, as you pointed out, very uh, that uh, we don't have a, a national exchange program in Mexico. We have you know, some isolated efforts. But uh, if we were to implement a kidney exchange program in Mexico, our distribution blood type is such that uh, we would get more benefit in, in uh, uh, talking in proportion that uh, with the American population, that's due, uh, well, uh, partly because we have a lot of typos and, you know, those kind of types. So um, have you seen those, uh, those kind of uh, uh, behaviors in other countries? Well, there's not a lot of international exchange yet. Uh, you know, there's some effort to do the, um, uh, Scandia Transplant, the, the organization that shares deceased donors among the Nordic countries is trying to organize kidney exchange. But in fact, for just the reasons you say, there's, um, there's promise in organizing exchange among more distant countries because it's not just blood type distribution, it's HLA distribution. So it makes a patient highly sensitized if they have a lot of uh, antibodies that they've gotten by being getting blood transfusions and things like that. So they have antibodies against HLAs that are common in their country and including some rare HLAs in their country. But it might be that when an American patient looks at a Mexican donor, there's, there's a chance that the Mexican donor has HLAs that the American patient hasn't been exposed to and doesn't have antibodies to. So there's different distribution, not just of blood type, but of HLAs. And we think that opens up a big possibility for highly sensitized patients to get uh, kidney exchange across real distances, not just in Scandinavia where judging from their hair color, they may have similar HLAs to each other in, in Denmark and Sweden. But, um, but for instance, in Asia and the United States, the distributions uh, seem to be somewhat different than in the Middle East and in the United States. Thank you. Right, uh, another question by Lavanya. Uh, hi, uh, this is Lavanya from the University of Illinois. Uh, Al, thank you so much for the great talk. This was really wonderful. Uh, I was wondering, or I had a couple of questions. One was, uh, I thought that in the problem that you described that deceased donors were already included uh, as, as the sort of the init initiating part of the chain. Uh, what uh, specifically is novel when you have deceased donors as opposed to as the chain currently exists? That's the first question. The second is, uh, can you talk a little bit about similar exchanges when uh, the organ uh, donation or exchange is time sensitive? I, I imagine kidneys, there is some time for which they can be stored, but if these are more time sensitive than that, are similar efficiencies possible or what other considerations become important? Okay, let me answer the second first, but, but your question about uh, deceased donation is a, is a good one, so don't let me forget. Uh, Kidneys are not stored. They, they have to be transplanted within about 36 hours and they are on ice. 
And in the US, we really try hard to transplant them within four hours. Um, and, and you know, mostly shorter than that. But they can't be stored. But they might be one day. I have a paper about what differences that would make if you could actually freeze them and thaw them. Uh, but the big thing about kidneys is they can be exchanged not because they last a long time, although they last much longer than hearts. Hearts just last four or five hours on ice. Uh, because you have two of them, so you can give one away. There's no heart exchange, right? No one can be a live donor for a heart. So hearts have to come just from deceased donors. So my, my impression was because the picture that lasted two years, the chain that lasted two years long. Or, or ah, no, no, but the, the kidney is living in the donor during that time. Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Absolutely, you know, the kidney, my kidneys are, are perfectly preserved at the moment because right. yeah. I've got them, I'll use them later. Um, so um, then you say, how about, why can't we start change with deceased donors? And that's entirely political, legal, and bureaucratic, right? So deceased donor kidneys are a national resource that are, that are heavily regulated by the United States through the National Organ Transplant Act, which created a set of organizations called OPTNs, Organ Procurement and Transplant Networks. And they're administered by a contractor called UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing. I've been on some UNOS committees, and, and UNOS committees are subcommittees of other committees, which are subcommittees of other committees. And every policy change they make eventually has to go out for public comment and things like that. So we're going to get to deceased donor chains, but it might still take years. We have a paper on it, you know, published a couple of years ago, and you know, it seems to be getting good reception. But what that means is UNOS committees are talking about it now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great. So let's maybe take one last question from Yota. Uh, hi. Thank you. Um, very nice talk. And um, so I wanted, actually, it's a similar t question to Lavania's question. Um, are there organs from the deceased that can start the chain? Um, is that possible, regulatory, or? Well, so there's little regulation about living donor transplantation, because you own your kidneys. So, you know, UNOS can't regulate who you could give them to or, you know, whether they should be given at all. That's, that's all your decision. Uh, there aren't many organs that can be donated, but, but your liver, it turns out, about 100 times more dangerously for the donor, um, you can donate a lobe of your liver. So there's some chance of donating livers, and there's been a little bit of liver exchange, particularly in Hong Kong. Um, and, and there's been one exchange that has been reported in the literature of a kidney exchange for a liver. Okay, so, so those things are possible, but, but there's much less volume in liver exchange because, because the, order, the, the order of magnitude danger for the donor is about one or two in 10,000 uh, per kidney, uh, you know, sort of serious you know, mortality or, or you know, serious impairment. And it's about a hundred times as big, you know, it's like one in a hundred for or, or one in 200 or one, you know, maybe improving a little bit for a liver. So, um, so, so there's just lots less volume in, in liver. And in liver transplant. The other reason is there's no liver dialysis. So the liver waiting list is much shorter than the kidney waiting list because we can't keep, keep liver patients alive while they wait. Uh, I meant because uh, in Israel, at least you have the option to um, have a card that you are a willing uh, donor um, donator after your uh, death. So, I mean, if it was possible to say, and I have a preference to give to some, to someone that might initiate a kidney chain. Yeah, that that would be and we're actually trying something like that with, the army has some special rules, so we might be able to do that. But the story in Israel, it's an interesting one, it's just within the deceased donor part. To be a donor, you, when you sign your donor card in Israel, you, you get some priority to get a deceased donor kidney if you need one, or a deceased donor organ. And so do members of your family, of, so do members of the family of someone who successfully is a deceased donor, right? So the family has to consent. And if they consent, then they get priority. Uh, and one of the things about this card that we worried about when the law was changed was, was it, you, you can check a box that says, I want to give a, an organ when I die, provided it's, it's um, approved by a, an ishtat, a, a, a man of religion uh, picked by my family. And we worried that that might be a way of getting priority 
but but choosing someone who would say, no, no, he hasn't been dead long enough yet, but that hasn't happened. So, so I think it's a model of, of how deceased donation could be improved. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, thank you again, Al, uh, and for the great talk and for all these uh, insightful uh, answers. Uh, I think this concludes our first seminar. Thank you everyone for joining us and we hope to see you in our uh, future talks. Very good, thank you for inviting me. Great, thanks.